Welcome to Speaking of Grace, the weekly message podcast from the Whole Life Church in Orlando, Florida. We're a multi-ethnic, multicultural, and multi-generational congregation committed to our mission of loving people into a lifelong friendship with God. We are committed to our vision of being a church without walls, fully engaged in serving the people of our community. Thank you for joining us as we continue Speaking of Grace. Well, hey there, family. I hope you are having a uh, good 4th of July weekend. I was glad to see there were some people here. It felt like everybody was leaving. I won't call out any of my staff who are on vacation right now. Good for them. Good for them. All right. Let's have a prayer as we start. Heavenly Father, um, as I speak on this topic today, topics, I really want to ask you to speak. I really pray that you wouldn't let anything come out of my mouth that isn't from you. I pray that you would help each person who's listening to hear what you're trying to say to them as well. Lord, may you be glorified. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. So uh, for those of you who didn't know, we are doing a really fun series during the month of July that we're calling God on the Big Screen. What we're doing is I've picked five. You heard that they were my five favorite movies. Maybe not my favorite movies, but the five church-appropriate movies <laughs> that, uh, that, that will be here, right? Okay. It would be appropriate for families to be viewing together, right? And besides that, I picked movies that I also thought had a point that I would like to make to you during this month and as we talk about Arise being our theme for the year. So the first movie that I chose for you to watch and that we showed on Tuesday night, if you weren't here, you really missed out, and the uh, children who are selling cookies really missed you. I want you to know they, would, they cotton candy. There's all kinds of stuff. So, you know, bring your cash next Tuesday and, uh, and enjoy it. And we do provide free popcorn, so there's, there's that. So Tuesday night, 6 o'clock. But what we showed last Tuesday night was a movie called Good Night and Good Luck. I've been surprised at how many people have never watched this before, were not familiar with the, the movie. Put out right around 2005. Um, it tells the true story of a man named Edward R. Murrow, who is a broadcasting legend. When I worked in news, uh, there were the Edward R. Murrow Awards that you could win for broadcasting. I always dreamed of winning one, never did. Um, so that, that speaks more to me than anything else. But anyway, but, uh, but legend in broadcasting, absolute legend. Worked at CBS, CBS News Division. What really catapulted him into the legendary category was a battle he took on in the 1950s with uh, the senator, the junior senator from Wisconsin, as he loved to call him, um, Joe McCarthy. Uh, if you're not familiar with your history book when it comes to Joe McCarthy, um, let me just tell you really quick. Joe McCarthy in early 1950s produced, um, held up a piece of paper that he said had the names of 205 communists who were working in the United States State Department and that the Secretary of State knew they were working there, and, he, and the U.S. Department Secretary of State was okay with them working there and shaping U.S. policy. Now, for those of you who may be a little bit younger than I am, being communist, called communist was not a good thing back then. Okay, like if you grew up in the late 70s, early 80s like I did, um, about the worst label any child could call you on the playground was being a communist. I mean, that would be like, you know, well, I won't go there because it's like that could be... <laughs> That could be dangerous. I, I went there first service and decided not to do it second service. So the point is, it wasn't something that was flattering. Maybe you have to think a little bit of how we label people sometimes. Just saying. Anyway, point being, he said, 205 communists. The only problem with this is that Joe never produced even a single name on that list. He never, he never gave the piece of paper. He was asked. In fact, they never were able to prove even one employee in the U.S. State Department. Now, I'm sure there must have been one, right? <laughs> but they weren't able to prove even one. But what happened is during this time period, Joe McCarthy started throwing that communist label onto anybody who disagreed with him. 
And he started using it as a tool to take on uh, his political opponents and people in the media and in different places like that. And so he started throwing that label around. And so this movie tells the story of how Edward R. Murrow actually stood up to Joe McCarthy. Now, as I watched the movie, I came across two themes. And these are the two themes that I came across. A rise to using media well, that was one, one that I saw. And the other was a rise to stand for what's right. So, which one do you want me to preach on? <laughs> Second one? Is anybody okay with me just doing both? Okay, I want to do both. I know this is, you're not supposed to do this as a speaker. It confuses people, but you're a smart group of people. You can do this, right? You can keep two ideas at the same time. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about both of these themes in this movie. So the movie actually begins and ends with a speech that Murrow gave on October 15, 1958 to the attendees of the Radio Television Digital News Association. It's a big deal in broadcasting, in, uh, broadcasting this, this association is. And so Murrow gave, gives this speech and it's, it, it bookends the movie. He begins the movie with it, it ends the movie with it. Little hint, usually whatever you begin with and what you end with is kind of important to the overall story that you're telling. So just a little thing when you watch movies, if you didn't know that, kind of think about how it wraps up, think about how it starts off, think about what changes in between, and you'll have a good idea of where that movie is driving and the message it's trying to push to you. And so what happens is, is that Murrow in this speech, a very famous speech that was known as the uh, Wires and Lights speech, the Wires and Lights speech, Murrow start, it uses a very, a very unpopular speech to give in this group of people because he basically lambasts them. And the beginning of the movie starts off with him talking about how rich and privileged the people in that room were and the ivory towers that they're sitting in. And, and basically what he says is, you guys have become very complacent. You have view the television as an opportunity to make money instead of inform people, to tell people information, to use it for something that I think is good. He had a very good reason for doing that. He had done that because he had just gotten in trouble recently for being too serious on television. His, uh, his boss is at, at CBS actually chastised him. They said, people don't want to watch this serious stuff you're taking on, Joe. It's depressing. It's, it's you know, don't do that. Just, you know, keep it light. Do, do little personal interviews and stuff like that. And he had uh, gotten in some trouble for that. And so he takes the media to task. And this is the last, uh, this is a little clip of that, uh, of that speech. This instrument can teach. It can illuminate, and yes, it can even inspire. But it can do so only to the extent that humans are determined to use it towards those ends. Otherwise, it is merely wires and lights in a box. Good night and good luck. Now, Murrow was concerned that, that it was just going to be used for mere entertainment. But I wonder if Murrow ever dreamed that the fact that you could marry entertainment with information and create a powerful medium for changing masses of people's minds. And in fact, I think that if we have seen over the last, what are we going on, 80 years now? 70, um, something like that. I was never good at math. Um, I think what we've seen over the last decades since then is that media has figured out how to take and a story and embed it with values that push us in a direction. And I think it is very naive for us in this day and age of information to think that anything we watch isn't loaded, loaded with an agenda. Whether you're watching the Avengers, which you might think is just entertainment, or you're watching Sesame Street, there are agendas being pushed in there. Some of them are good. Some of them are not. 
But my fear today is that a lot of us, including myself, in our media-saturated world, media is everywhere, everywhere. My fear is that in our media-saturated world, we have the same basic problem that Edward Murrow was talking about there, that we consume media the same way that I used to eat. You see, when I was a teenager, all the way up to about 30 years of age, I could eat anything I wanted. I weighed 155 pounds at 29 years of age. 155 pounds. I don't weigh that now. <laughs> and here's the problem. I could eat anything I wanted and keep it. I could not gain weight. I would drink those, like, I know, I know some of you are hating on me right now. I hate on my old self, too. <laughs> um, but I could eat. I mean, it didn't matter. I could eat as much as I could shovel down, and it just wouldn't, I wouldn't get any pounds on me. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. It does make a difference now. <laughs> and I developed habits then that have been very harmful to me now. Because when you don't look at what's in your food and you don't worry about it, it will catch up with you if you are an average person <laughs> eventually. <laughs> and I'm afraid that we do the same thing with our media. We just consume it, and we don't really stop to think, what is it doing to me? What direction is it pushing me in? We don't take the time to stop after we've watched a movie and say, now, what was the message in that movie? We just go, hey, I was entertained. Famous line from a movie, were you entertained? <laughs> was I entertained? If I was entertained, thumbs up. If I wasn't entertained, thumbs down. But we don't worry as much about, was I informed? Was I informed well? Was this a worthwhile time spent? Hey, I'm preaching to Ken too, okay? So don't feel it's personal. I'm talking to Ken. Ken tends to, oh, this is interesting. Let me watch this and then move on with my day. Life is happening fast. But the problem is when we don't think about it, we don't realize the calories that are going in and what's about to happen to us. Now, there are a few of you that were like applauding me. Now, you're gonna, now I'm going to talk to you. There are those of you who think that it's wrong to watch movies and television. You think it's, it's a bad thing to do. There's even groups of people out there that will tell you what you should and shouldn't watch. And they'll tell you, this is bad, that's good. Interestingly, they've somehow watched it all and know. <laughs> but apparently, they don't think you're smart enough to do the same thing that they did. To take a movie, to watch it critically, and then make some judgments on it. What's the problem here? I think the problem is that they're unaware that Jesus used quote-unquote worldly entertainment to capture the attention and to teach the people in his time. And a few of you are about to like go ballistic now. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. What are you talking about, worldly entertainment? Well, a favorite quote of mine from Ellen White, who is one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and I believe was inspired, comes from a book called Christ Object Lessons, page 20. One of my favorite quotes of all time, because here she says something that I think is worth all of us hearing loud and clear. She says that at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he spoke in words that were plain and straightforward. Think about Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount. Just teachings, boom, 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 right? Kind of sermonizing. But you know what she said? Jesus realized that the masses were not paying attention. He was losing their attention. Now, I want you to think about this. Ellen then says that Jesus shifted to telling parables. So he goes from preaching at them to telling them stories. Boy, that ought to be instructive to us. If we're not able to capture people's attention, maybe we should stop and not blame them for our methods not working and re-examine the methods we're using. 
This is what Ellen says. Parable teaching was popular. Oh, so it's not bad to use something that's popular. Parable teaching was popular and commanded the respect and attention not only of the Jews, but of the people of other nations. No more effective method of instruction could he have employed. Do you catch that? Jesus took a method. See, the method's not what's always wrong. It's how you use the method that can be right or wrong. He takes the method and he starts using it. Now, a few of you going, okay, I'm down with you still. That's all right. Can I take it one step further for you? And I know this is going to be a little hard. Did Jesus only use parables that were true stories? For all my Seventh-day Adventist friends here in, in the church, you have to say no. You're required by Seventh-day Adventist law to say no, even though there are those who will tell you within this denomination otherwise. Why? Well, Seventh-day Adventists believe that when a person dies, they sleep, that they rest. They don't know anything until Jesus returns. Seventh-day Adventists do not believe in an everlasting hell. Now, don't you remember a story that Jesus told called the rich man and Lazarus where there was a guy who had been kind of naughty, didn't care about the poor, and he goes to the bosom of Abraham where he sees another poor person. I'm sorry, (laughs) Lazarus. Boy, I messed that up first service. Might want to go back and edit that. Um, (laughs) The poor man goes to the bosom of Abraham. The rich man goes to hell. The poor man sees Lazarus suffering in hell and says, hey, can I take a little bit of water to him? And Abraham goes, no, sorry, there's a chasm between us. And it's actually the rich man, part of me, who's asking for that water. And, and so there we go. I'm really butchering this one today. I, I apologize. I'm just so excited about it. My point is this. Jesus took a story that was laced with Greek mythology, because that's where the theory of hell comes from, by the way. It's not a Christian concept, and it's not a a Jewish concept. It is a Greek myth. myth. Jesus takes Greek mythology. He mixes it into his story. Why? Was Jesus trying to lie to them? No, because Jesus knew his listeners weren't getting a theological lesson on what happens to a person when they die. They were getting a theological lesson about not caring about the poor, And so Jesus takes a story that will make the point in the best way possible with the most impact, not saying this is theologically what's going to happen, but rather saying, look, think. Think about that person you walk past every day and don't care about. So Jesus was known to use parables that blended in some beliefs that might not exactly theologically add up. Again, don't lose sight. Jesus wasn't lying to anybody. He was telling the truth through that story to make a larger point. Tim Keller also makes an interesting point in his book, The Prodigal God, which if you haven't read, you should put it on your reading list. It is fabulous. The Prodigal God by Tim Keller. He makes the point that Jesus was retelling a story that the Jewish leaders in his time, religious leaders, told. That all of his listeners were familiar of the story of the prodigal son, the son that that takes his inheritance, goes and squanders it, and then comes back. And I've summarized it pretty quickly. (laughs) But here's the thing. When the Jewish leaders told that story, when the son came home, he was rejected by the father. The father said, you have disrespected the family. You have done irreparable damage to our reputation. Now go live with the decisions you've made. Can you see how Jesus takes this parable and just absolutely turns it on its head? He takes it and he takes it in a way that his audience would have never expected. This father takes this son back in spite of the irreparable damage that this son had done to the reputation of the father and the family. Not only does he take him back, but he runs to him. 
something that Middle Eastern men at that time did not do. I think it's important that we be in the world, but not of the world. But that doesn't mean that we don't see the things that are happening around us and be able to relate to people and share with people the gospel using images and, and dare I say it, movies and TV that they can relate with. Even if that movie's intended purpose wasn't the one that you're making for later. Jesus uh, has a, a fun little parable that he tells about a um, dishonest servant. The dishonest servant steals from his master and then uses that money later on to buy some friends for himself so that when his master uh, fires him, he'll have some buddies out in the village. So he uses his master's wealth to buy influence for himself later on. And you would expect Jesus to, to give him a good slap on the wrist for that in his verbal telling of that parable. But instead, Jesus goes, yeah, he was pretty smart. He commends him. And he says it this way. He says, it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of light. Stop and think about that. Hollywood is way smarter than we as Seventh-day Adventists are in the way that we deal with the people around us. They're very smart with the way that they put out the messages that they want to do, and the things they want to say. And I don't bear them any ill will for it. What I do say is, perhaps the people of God ought to wake up and use the technology that God has provided us with and speak in terms that are understandable to the world around us rather than in King James Version English that nobody on earth uses anymore. That's biblical. Here's the lesson. Use your world re resources to benefit others and to make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. What are you using the resources? What are you using the media that you consume to do? Just to entertain yourself? Or are you using it to reach other people with the gospel of Christ? Are you using it to inform yourself so that you can understand what's happening in the world around you? Or are you taking it in just so you can be entertained? And in doing so, you become transformed into the image of the things that you're watching rather than being discerning with what you're watching. You know, we as Christians really love either ors, but sometimes we have to understand it's and. So let's go ahead and turn ourselves over to the standing up for what's right. Some of you who are paying attention know I'm running out of time and that is true. Edward R. <laughs> Thank you. Murrow stood up to McCarthy, and I, I think that one of the things that as Christians, we have become such a pain-adverse culture. We want to have the right to speak our mind without the, con the consequences that go with speaking our mind. And Murrow stood up and spoke the truth and understood there were going to be some consequences. And you know what? He and Fred Friendly, his producer, actually paid for their ad revenue that they lost when they spoke the truth. It came out of their pocket. There are a lot of us who want to speak the truth but not pay the tab. And there's always a tab to be paid. Jesus paid a tab for speaking the truth to power. John the Baptist paid the tab for speaking the truth to power. Those three boys in Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, paid the tab. They were willing to pay the tab. Daniel, the lion's den. Family. Speaking the truth, should, we should always do it, but we shouldn't be surprised when people aren't happy about it. We shouldn't be surprised about that. When Edward R. Murrow took McCarthy, uh, McCarthy on, McCarthy would come on and give a rebuttal to what McCarthy had said. And instead of rebutting the facts in the case... McCarthy just went after Murrow. He said that Murrow had belonged to a communist-affiliated uh, labor union, which wasn't true. And he's tried to imply that, that 
that Murrow was pushing a communist agenda, which if you know anything about Murrow, Murrow had no sympathy for communists. But he did have sympathy for people who were being bullied. And so after that happens, this is Murrow's response on the air to what McCarthy has said about him. Having searched my conscience and my files, I cannot contend that I have always been right or wise, but I have attempted to pursue the truth with some diligence and to report it, even though, as in this case, I had been warned in advance that I would be subjected to the attentions of Senator McCarthy. We shall hope to deal with matters of more vital interest to the country next week. Good night and good luck. This weekend and on Monday, the United States is going to celebrate its 246th birthday. And one of the reasons I picked this movie is because I believe it is a patriotic movie. I know that we usually think the patriotic movies are the Saving Private Ryan's or, or whatever, but this is a patriotic movie. Why? Because it goes back to one of the core principles of the United States, the right to speak up to power. It is amazing to me how many people and politicians in this country have forgotten that our country was founded 246 years ago by a bunch of people who stood up to King George in England and said, that's not right. That's not right. In British countries, there's a thing called the loyal opposition. And it's the idea that you are still loyal even if you oppose the policies that the country is pursuing. You might think, well, we're talking politics now, Ken. Yes, we are. And we're also going to talk about church politics. So I'm going to step on both landmines at the same time. It is a mistake to think that we should squash people who don't agree with the party line. It is a deadly mistake. Loyalty to an organization or a country has nothing to do with agreement. In fact, one of the most patriotic, most Christian things you can do is speak up when you know something's not right. George Clooney, who wrote and directed and starred in Good Night and Good Luck, told us why he wrote the movie. He did it because he was mad about being called a traitor after calling into question why American troops were going to go into Iraq the second time. Now, whether you agree with the decision to go into Iraq that second time or don't, I want you to put that on the side. Did Clooney have the right as an American citizen to use whatever platform that he had to speak up and say what he thought? Yes. Whether you agree with it or don't agree with it. And so when Clooney made the movie, one of the things you need to know about this movie is this is Clooney's response to the criticism he was receiving. So as you start thinking about the, the messaging that Clooney's trying to send your way as you digest it, you need to understand that. In fact, in a PBS NewsHour he, uh, interview, he said this, I was looking to open... I was looking to open a debate, to have a discussion, to be able to talk about issues that I think are important. It's simply saying, as Murrow says in the film, we have to find a way to find a safe place between the protection of the individual and the protection of the state at the same time. That's not easy, but it's worth a conversation. You know, our, our nation was birthed by founders who stood up to Great Britain and King George, and in the 246 intervening years, this country has continued that tradition. Brave Americans have stood up to those in authority and used the freedoms this country has granted to fight for what is right and at times have stood up even when that right was denied them. Anytime you stand up for what is right, there will be a cost. Murrow and Friendly had to pay out of their pocket. They lost sponsorship. They were eventually moved to Sunday out of a prime time spot during the week. And we see the same thing happening with Jesus. The question is, are we willing to stand up for what we believe? To respectfully, respectfully stand up for it. To kindly, gracefully say, hey, this isn't right. And if we're on the other side, are we willing to allow others to do the same? Those in, our pow those in power, both in our country and our church, would do well to remember that dissent is not disloyalty. 
Dissent is the vaccine that keeps the virus of power from destroying the body. None of us like it when somebody disagrees with a position that we hold sacred. I know I don't. Yet that disagreement can be the iron that sharpens iron if we will engage thoughtfully. If we have the truth, we have nothing to fear in the conversation. And if we do not have the truth, we have everything to gain from the conversation. We don't have to be afraid of having conversations with people. It's one of the points that Murrow makes in the movie. If democracy is superior to communism, why are we afraid to talk to communists? I believed 20 years ago, and I believe today, that mature Americans can engage in conversation and controversy, the clash of ideas, with communists anywhere in the world without becoming contaminated or converted. I believe that our faith, our conviction, our determination are stronger than theirs, and that we can compete and successfully, not only in the area of bombs, but in the area of ideas. I believe that is true both politically in our country, and I believe that is true within the church. There are some very difficult issues facing the Christian church and the Seventh-day Adventist church. And the answer is not to shut down dialogue, it's to open dialogue. It's to talk more, not talk less. It's to allow voices that disagree with us to be heard rather than stifling them and shuffling them out of the way. Because I believe truth wins. I believe truth wins. I believe truth wins. Let's use our media well. Whatever we do or say, let's do it as a representative of the Lord, giving thanks through him to the God our Father. When you're watching that movie, are you watching it as a representative of God? Ask yourself that question as you're watching that TV show, consuming that media. Or are you doing it as a representative of your own self? Do it for God. Arise to stand for what is right, knowing that there's always going to be a price tag. But even if you suffer for doing what's right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. God's got us. Now is the time in the service where it's your opportunity to respond to the sermon. And if you haven't already, join me on the website and you can post questions in the chat right now. Um, this sermon series is one that I enjoy because I went to film school and I love, and oh, wow, rude. That was scary, wasn't it? Uh, but the, uh, There's no water uh, in there. So someone I gave us cups so no myself. water. But the, uh, <laughs> Anyway, I love analyzing films, so I'm, I'm enjoying this series already. And uh, uh, I think that this film kind of ends a little bit darkly, almost like a tragedy, because he's been pushed to a bad time, uh, sponsors are leaving, and he basically ends with, good night, good luck, you're on your own. Integrity has left the building. There so, it is. It, what? Yep. I said, there it is. There it is. You've summarized so, it. Summarized it. Um, we are already a little bit over time, but we are getting a lot of questions. You have a lot of explaining to do. I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought um, I might. This one comes from, uh, from a friend. I'll just say, asking for a friend. And uh, are, you, are you saying that the traditional hard methods used by parents and their parents may be irrelevant for my children and their children? They worked for me, I think, is what this so person say the, asked. Say the what? The, the methods? The traditional hard methods used by my parents. They worked on me. I'm a good person, right? Yeah. So why can't I use them? Without knowing what, you're talk, what, what hard methods we're talking about. I mean, if you're, you know, no TV shows? That's the no way TV. I was raised. It could be. Okay. Asking for a friend. Oh, okay. Say. Asking for a friend. <laughs> so <laughs> here's what I'd say. I, I think that we... Um, I think we owe it to ourselves to ask what we're letting our children consume. Um, I know in my family, uh, my, my daughter who's here today can testify that they did not get to watch movies and television until they were really close to their teenage years. Um, it, we really uh, curtailed it. And I know that we live in mouse infested country, but we didn't let them watch Disney stuff very much either. 
Um, and I'm not here to knock any of it. What I'm saying is I want my child to be mature enough to understand that the themes that they're putting into their mind, and I want to be putting the themes into their mind while their mind is like wet concrete. Um, and so I think we really have to be thoughtful with what we let our children watch. If you haven't done your research on children and screen time, and you have children, you really owe it to yourself to do your research on that and to ask yourself what you're putting into your child. Again, as my children got older, my, I remember my daughter being blown away around 13 or 14 years of age. She was at a, at a friend's house and she called me up and she said, oh, they're showing a movie I know you wouldn't want me to watch. What do I do? I said, do what you, you it's your choice. You're there, you choose. What, you're not gonna tell me what to do? No, I'm not. You know, you know what I think about things, but you, you're at a point where you have to start making choices. Another point, my son had a series of movies that wasn't really on our super approved list, but he was like, I think I'm going to watch them over at a friend's house. And I said, mm, let's watch them together. I think that's one of the other things we have to recognize too. Our children are probably going to start watching movies at some point when we don't have complete control. And there are some things that I would rather watch with them and be able to talk through together than rather to have them talk through it or not talk through it with their friends in a different situation. So again, we like to make things black and white, but I think we ought to kind of understand that there's a lot of nuance to life. And by the way, what works for my kids might not work for your kids. So I'm not here to judge any of that. I'm just saying be thoughtful about whatever you do. Don't just kind of be like, oh, whatever, I'm sure things will work out. I, I'm personally of the mindset of that you do need to train and not necessarily just uh, completely restrict because um, one of my best friends growing up didn't have a TV and never was allowed to watch movies. And the second he moved out, it was just like watched whatever he wanted because he was never taught, this is not something you should watch or this is something you should avoid. And of course he was an adult by then so he could make wiser decisions, but it, it is one of those now that I'm finally free, I can just run as far away as I can. And we need to be teaching our kids the principles behind it, not just don't do that, but mm -hmm. why not? Why is a legitimate question. So let's talk about it. Why is this maybe not the best thing to be watching? Let's have a conversation about that. Okay, I think, well, we're already over. I'm going to ask only one more, so stick with us. All right, I'll keep this, it short. This one comes from uh, someone going by Hero on our chat. Uh, and I will just read it to you here. The thing is, no one wants to speak truth because they are afraid of being canceled. Look at, um, and they listed a name, Ka uh, Kaepernick. Um, look at what happened to him. Um, some, some may even disagree that he spoke truth, but we won't go there. Let's just ignore the name to say this person spoke, said something, they got canceled. Look at what happened to him. So how do you encourage people to speak truth and not be afraid of the consequences? It, it goes back to, you know, it goes back to what I said earlier in the sermon. Speaking truth always has a price tag on it. Always, always. And a lot of us don't want to pay the price. And so if you don't want to pay the price, then don't pay the price. But don't complain that you're not able to speak. Mm. You can speak. There's just a price tag that goes with it. Jesus had to pay a price. We have to pay a price sometimes. And, and goodness knows, I'm the first one to start whining when I have to pay the price. <laughs> I'll cry about it. I don't, I, you know, it hurts my feelings when a church member says, oh, you're so wrong in your sermon. Blah, 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 you know, this and this, this, this. And that. It hurts my feelings. It does. But it's the price of getting up front and speaking. It's the price. I don't have to like it. I just have to understand it's part of what, what happens. And we can be risk adverse and we should complain that we shouldn't have to pay a price. And by the way, there, and I'm not using any particular example, there are some people who should pay a price for what they say. You know, there's some things that are really hateful that deserve a price tag on them. So uh, I worry about cancel culture too. Um, I do, but I don't, I think the answer to cancel culture is to just keep speaking the truth. That's what I think the answer is. Keep it to the truth. Well, I'm sorry, Tim and Igor and others, we will get to your questions uh, at our podcast and there's some good ones here.
That podcast is called This Is Whole Life and comes out Wednesday morning. It's available everywhere that podcasts are heard. And thank you so much. And I look forward to that podcast. Thank you, Stanley. Amari, is it going to embarrass you if you come stand here beside me? If it is, you don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. If you, aren't, if you aren't here earlier, Amari got baptized this morning, and we're really proud of you. And uh, I want you to look out at all these people. This is your family. I know there's, there's you know, blood family right down here, but that's your family. And I want you to kind of see it because it matters. You know, families, my family doesn't politically agree. I have family members that agree on a lot of different political things or a lot of different places religiously, but we're family. We still keep our last name or family. So let's be that way. Let's be the church that loves each other, looks at things differently, but we're loving about it. And Omari, you're a part of that now. You were before, but it's official now. Let's pray. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we thank you for Omari, for the decision he's made. I'm so proud of him, Lord. I want to pray that there are others in this room who need to make that same decision for you. I want to pray that they would. I pray they'd be inspired by his testimony. And Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would rest heavy on Omari. I pray he would be a man that does your will, that speaks your truth, that isn't afraid to pay the price for following you, knowing that there is a crown stored up for him in heaven if he's faithful. May we all be that way, Lord. We pray in your name. Amen. Love you. Proud of you. All right, family, I expect to see it this crowded this coming Tuesday night. Uh, We're we're watching one of my, it is my favorite Pixar movie, Inside Out. So we'll see you Tuesday night. Yeah, okay, I got some, some fans there. See you then, God bless. You know I love you. Go love your world. Hi, this is Randy McGray, podcast producer and host here at Whole Life Church. Loving people into a lifelong friendship with God is our mission at the Whole Life Church, and our podcasts, Speaking of Grace, and its companion, 15 with Andy, Randy, and Jeff, are designed to help facilitate conversations that help us grow together in that pursuit. Now that you've heard the message for this week, don't forget to check out the Whole Life Takeaways for this message. Swipe up in today's show notes and join the conversation. Speaking of conversations, each Wednesday morning we take a closer look at the week's message. That's right, the one you just listened to. We discuss practical ways to apply spiritual lessons and ask honest questions about the issues we face as Christians, all focused through the lens of grace. Your voice is a welcomed addition to that conversation. We encourage your thoughts and your questions by sending a voicemail or text to 407-965-1607 or send an email to podcast at wholelife.church. You can find everything podcast related on our website, wholelife.church slash podcast. And plan on spending every Tuesday evening and Wednesday morning with us as we bring you the Whole Life Church inspiration you love straight into your headphones. Thanks for listening and have a great week.